Give us the money or turn back from where you came, the robbers said to our guide. I was only eight, but I was well aware what this would mean. Would we make it alive without any food or water? And if we did, what would the Chinese do to us? It was only a few weeks earlier when my parents picked me up from school in Lhasa, Tibet. How would you like to go on a field trip and make some new friends, Tenzi? My father asked me. With excitement, I jumped up and said, yes, this would be so exciting. Great to see you're excited. You'll have a good time, my mom said. I remember looking at her a bit surprised as I saw the tears in her eyes, but she quickly shrugged off any of my concerns. We walked back home hand in hand. This was going to be a great adventure. Little did I know then that my parents were sacrificing everything they owned and potentially their own lives in order for me to escape from persecution and oppression. My mom told me I was doing well in school and that I was selected to be sent to Beijing to continue my studies there. But my family soon realized that these selected students were being sent there to be trained as mouthpieces for Chinese propaganda. Yet going against the Chinese was dangerous. They heavily cracked down on those who opposed them. They raided homes and hurt families, burned down monasteries and assaulted monks. Telling me over and over how much they loved me, they walked me over to meet the guide and the other five kids. As I was excited to meet the other kids and go on the trip, my parents gave me one last hug before letting me go. Don't worry, Mom. I'll be back in a couple of days. I'll miss you, but I'll have fun with my friends. We'll miss you too, son, my father said as he hugged my mom, who couldn't hold her tears. I hopped on the truck with the guide and my friends. Off we went to a few days of adventure, or so I thought. The truck dropped us off at the foot of a big mountain. We were going to climb all the way across it, I remember the guide telling us. But, he said, we're going to make this a bit more exciting. We're going to walk at night and sleep at daytime. And no matter what happens, stay out of sight of the men in uniforms. Just like hide and seek. If they find us, we lose. The sun was about to set, and there we went, off into the mountains. We had to walk up steep slopes, across rivers, and go through caves. Since it was night and there were uniforms all over the place, we couldn't use any torch. So many times we couldn't really see where we were going. I remember losing my backpack in one of the rivers. This had all my extra clothes and shoes in it, but we would soon be back home, I thought, so no problem. Pretty soon, however, we found out this wasn't a field trip or an innocent game. The guide told us we had no choice but to make it to the other side of the mountains. Turning back or getting caught was no option. I was only eight, but I did somewhat get the seriousness of the situation. On top of that, we were pretty much out of food and water. We had either ate it or lost it along the way. It was hell after that. We had to walk and climb for hours every night with barely anything to eat or drink. We started melting ice and I even remember drinking from bowls meant for cows. We would eat whatever we could get our hands on, irrespective of its taste. I remember plucking and eating raw bananas from a tree somewhere. I can still see the shocked eyes and the choked faces of the other kids as we chewed on the unripe fruit. A few weeks in, my shoes also started to fall apart. I only had the one pair of old shoes I started off with and I had sewn it over and over with rope, plastic, anything that helped in holding them together. For as long as I remember, my toes and feet always had injuries. Fortunately, however, 
I didn't get frostbite, unlike some of the other kids. I never imagined our bodies could actually turn black from the cold. As we started getting higher up in the mountains, out of reach of the patrols, we started to switch to walking during the day. We all got excited as our guide told us we were nearing halfway. But just as I was getting happy about not having to climb in the dark and getting closer to reaching the other side, it was like the lights turned off. I lost my sight. I remember shouting, I am blind, I am blind. The guide took me on his back and told me to calm down. He said I suffered from photokeratitis and that it's temporary. It was a natural reaction from overexposure to the blinding reflection of the sunlight in the snow. After several days of climbing at high altitudes with almost no food or water and barely any shoes on our feet anymore, we got to the other side of the mountains. At the little mountain villages, we often begged for food, water, and a place to sleep. We were often helped by monks and nuns who shared what little they had with us. This knocking on doors was not without danger, as also here the Chinese military patrols were all over the place, and not only the Chinese themselves, we would later learn. We had to get back to our walk by night rhythm again. One early morning, we were welcomed into the home of a kind man who promised us food, drink, and a warm place to sleep for the day. But as soon as we stepped in, we were taken prisoner by a group of men. It was confusing as they looked Tibetan, spoke Tibetan, but still wanted to harm us. Their fellow Tibetans? It soon became clear they were Tibetans working for the Chinese government. As a side business, they liked to steal money from people like our guide, who takes people into exile, officers by day and robbers by night. The robbers told us to undress. No, luckily it's not what you might think. We didn't even know it ourselves, but they knew our parents had sewn money inside the hems of the pants, our shirts, and our underwear. We would need this money when we would reach India, but now the robbers would take it. This was so unfair. How could they do this to us? After taking all of it, they told the guide they wanted more money or else they wouldn't let us go. More money or they would turn us in to the Chinese patrols. While laughing, they said, or you walk back to Tibet, where you belong. We were clearly out of money. Where did they think we would get any more money from? We didn't have any more to hide. But the guide confessed that two of the kids in the group had relatives with money in Nepal. If he could take them to their relatives, perhaps they would give money for the robbers. Fine, the robbers said. Take those two, get the money, and come back here for the others. And hurry up, or there won't be any kids to come back to. So they just kept myself and three other kids as hostages for days. Luckily, the robbers were just out for money and not to hurt us. We were imprisoned, but we were already happy to have a warm place to sleep, food to eat, and water to drink. Our bodies were clearly yearning for this long overdue rest and nourishment. So strange as it may sound, it didn't feel like we were treated unfairly for those couple of days in captivity. However, we did start to wonder after a couple of days, will the guide come back for us? What if we were handed over to the Chinese after all we had been through? The robbers clearly started to get more restless and started debating whether they should turn us in. Forget about the guide, one robber said to the other. Let's just take the finder's fee from the Chinese. It's still a big amount of money and better than nothing if the guide doesn't come back. Just as the others started nodding, someone knocked on the door. It was the guide. He came back for us. 
well fed and free again, we continued our journey with the guide. This final bit on foot went fast and before long, we reached Nepal. The relatives of the other two kids had offered us to stay with them for a while. We were well fed and rested up there the remainder of our cross Himalaya journey. Finally, we were sent to the Tibetan Reception Center in India, where we were allocated to our respective schools and communities to live. I was sent to Mussoorie. I'm happy to say that I'm now well settled in Dekhailing, a Tibetan settlement in India. I've been lucky enough to meet my wonderful wife and together have a seven months old daughter. My wife is a teacher here at a local school and I work here at a company designing and manufacturing glass beads, lamps, handcrafts, paintings, and jewelry. My parents were captured by the Chinese, and I never found out what happened to them. Not a day goes by without thinking of them, thanking them for the love they gave me and the sacrifice they made to give me a chance of having a future. Like Fenzi, about 80,000 Tibetans fled from Tibet between 1959 and 1960, when the Chinese government violently cracked down on Tibetans trying to claim their independence. Tibet has had a tumultuous history, with some periods functioning as an independent entity and others ruled by powerful Chinese and Mongolian dynasties. Tibet is under control of the Chinese, but with the use of violence to impose their rule Tens of thousands of Tibetans have been killed, and most monasteries have been destroyed. Until today, tensions remain, as its people's allegiance is with the 14th Dalai Lama and his government in exile, and don't want to submit to the oppressive Chinese rule. Tibetans continue to flee, with estimates of over 150,000 living in exile today. Though most are well settled in Nepal, India, and Bhutan, Many still wish to return to their homeland sometime in the future, hopefully reuniting with family if they are still alive. <laughs>